baddies. I have an amazing empowered woman on with us today and we are going to deep dive this specific topic I'm about to share in a minute. But Miss Lindsay White, thank you so much for joining us. Lindsay is a mother of three kids. She is a business owner with a freaking badass brand about breastfeeding. Okay, y'all got to go check her out and we'll share that information in a little bit. She also is a Latina owned businesswoman. She is a wife. Did I miss anything? Founder of the hashtag drop the cover. Founder of the <laughs> hashtag drop the cover. Yes. <laughs> I love it. But yeah. thank you. No, thanks for having me. I haven't been on a podcast in a while. So this is fun. And in person, it's always like over Zoom. So right. how yeah. fun to get to do it. I know. We're just going back to like the real, real, you yeah. know, <laughs> getting the video, making it like happen. We well, so. have to have video now these days, right? Everything is video uh-huh. reels and TikTok. And I know that's, that's something we're going to touch on. Like, how do you keep up with that? I mean, you're doing so much. And I know that there's a million other roles you play and things that you do that I didn't <clears> mention <throat> being your own business owner, but also being connected to your own intuition and your own voice. That's something that you talk about a lot. Mm-hmm. Use your voice, even if it shakes. We have your back. We have your back. Yes. I love that. (laughs) So let's just kind of backtrack before this moment. How did you start? How did, what's your personal journey of birthing the little milk bar? (laughs) So I actually owned a company called Lot 801 before this, and it was like baby leggings. And I would sew these leggings on Etsy and sell them. And it was not like doing too well. Like it was sustaining itself, but I wasn't making an income off of it. So I was to the point where I'm like, do I go back to like corporate world? What do I do? Um, But I had my son and I have to rewind a little bit more. So when I had my daughter, Allie, she's 10 now. She's your first. She was my first. Um, I hated my breastfeeding journey with her. And it's just oh. funny when people hear that because I'm like the breastfeeding ran, but like my first journey, it was not fun. Wow. I think we went 18 months, couldn't wait to be finished. And it was miserable. You know, after you have a baby, you're so isolated. Your hormones are crazy. You feel alone. You cry a lot for no reason. Um, but during my breastfeeding journey, I didn't know anyone else that breastfed. And I was like one of the first of my friends to have kids. And so it was like, how do I navigate this new world of breastfeeding? Right. And it was like I'd schedule my whole day around her feeding schedule. I wouldn't leave the house if I had to feed her. And if I did, I always had a cover or, you know, I'd get invited to a party from a friend, like a barbecue. And I was so excited to finally go. But then we'd get there and the baby would be hungry. So I'd go feed in a private room. And she mm-hmm. was a slow eater, like 40 minutes each side. It was ridiculous. So by the time I was done feeding her and I'm like, yeah, I get to go like interact with my friends. I get out there and it was time to go. And I'm like, well, that sucked. My husband got to hang out with everybody while I mm-hmm. fed the baby. So anyways, when I... And she's your first too. My first. Yeah. So like being a new mom of yeah, everything, it's just it all out. like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So then I got pregnant with my son Coda And I made a promise to myself the moment I found out I was pregnant that this round was going to be completely different, that I was going to enjoy this breastfeeding journey, that I was going to have more confidence, and I was just going to live my normal life while breastfeeding rather than trying to alter my life around my breastfeeding journey and changed everything for me. I had him and we... My life was great. I'd go to friend's house and I'd feed right there in front of them. Nobody said a word. Nobody cared. We'd go to the restaurant. I'd feed him. And instead of, you know, with Ali, I would have um, left the restaurant, went into my car and fed her Mm -hmm. and missed the whole family meal. You know, you go out for birthdays or whatever. And I'd miss everything. By the time I came back, it was bill was paid, ready to go. So with Coda, I would just sit at the dinner table and eat and nobody cared and my life just went on like normal and it was fantastic and I'm like gosh I wish I I would have done this sooner like why didn't somebody just tell me Mm -hmm. that I could I didn't even know that I could Mm -hmm. um so anyways I'm at a wedding and my mom walks up to me and she says I'm feeding Coda and she goes do you really think you should be doing that here maybe you should go to the bathroom and do that and I just looked at her and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> You're, and like, you worked so hard to get to this point. Yes. Yeah. So I remember distinctly thinking if she had said this to the five-year-old Lindsay, that's what I always say, because Allie and Coda are five years apart. If she had said this to the five-year-old Lindsay, I would have been mortified. I would have got right up from my seat, 
went straight to the bathroom in tears, been embarrassed, thinking, was everybody else thinking the same thing? And I would have sat in a dirty bathroom stall and fed her while I was miserable and in tears. And I'm like, I'm so thankful that this time I have so much more confidence. So I just looked at her and I said, no, thanks. We're comfortable where we're at. And that that was it. Wow. But on the way home from that wedding, I remember driving in the car with my husband and I turned to him and I said, you know, if someone would have just told me back then that I could like, hey, you can feed here. You don't have to go to the bathroom. You don't have to go to the car. Then that would have made my life so much easier. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I want to be that person for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what do you mean? (laughs) And I'm like, 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 I'm like thinking not just my friends, like, how do I reach other people that don't know that they just can right or get like I just want to be that best friend that cheers them on and gives them permission and so um I was like I think I want to start like gearing towards breastfeeding like with my business Mm -hmm. so we released a milk maker shirt and we sold out in like 24 hours (sighs) and I was like okay like we're on to something so then I doubled inventory put it out again and we sold out in 48 hours and I'm like okay this the world needs this. Like this isn't just me who needs this. It's not just a passion project. This is something that every people are connecting to. And so I completely like that day, I decided to rebrand from La 801 to the little milk bar and focus on what my passion was at the time and still is, which is empowering breastfeeding moms. And from there we went milk maker teas, mind your own tits. And then they use your voice. Even if it shakes, we have your back and yeah. That's how it, that's how it's, it's a long story, but that's how it came to fruition. I love that. And I love how bold you are in your brand because I feel like it's, it like is a next level, like middle finger to the Mm -hmm. old ways of having to feel shame for like your body or like something that's so natural. Yeah. Well, it was scary. Like yeah. if I if I'm being completely honest, the very first photo shoot I did for the little milk bar was this boot blanket that we had released. And I remember I was going to daybreak here in Utah and I was like, OK, I'm going to feed Coda and I'm going to breastfeed him on one boob while I'm holding the blanket with the other side. And we're just going to take these really cool photos. And I was like trying to figure out on what to wear. And I was like, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I got to do it all the way. So I'm like. I have to make a huge statement to show like that this is completely normal. So I decided not to wear a shirt because I was like, what do I wear? I'm like, I'm going to just go topless. I'm not going to wear a shirt at all. (laughs) And I'll just have like this jacket. I had this jacket kind of like hanging over my shoulders. Yeah. And I'm like to to be almost even more out there, you know, and to be honest, when I was doing that photo shoot, I was still a little bit nervous to be that out there. But the moment I did it, I'm like, oh, this is so normal. Like, this is what it should be like. Like, no one should even bat an eye. Yeah. And then I remember being scared to show my mom those photos because at yeah. the time she still was not on board with the whole public breastfeeding and right. all of that. But she came around. Now she's my biggest supporter. So I that's know. awesome. <laughs> like, you just launched the alley bra. Yeah. I love seeing her in yes. that with you. Yes. Yes. She's like there all the time too. Like at my photo shoots, she'll come and help when she can because she still works. So Mm -hmm. she's like her time is limited. But I do love that she comes around. And I like to talk about that because so many women who are breastfeeding, a lot of times I hear it's their mom that says something or it's their mother-in-law. And how do you get them to come around? And I think from the beginning, I've always said the more you see of something, the more normal it becomes. So like my whole social media is showing breastfeeding as much as possible. And Mm -hmm. so the more my mom saw, you know, me feeding in public and other women feeding in public and, you know, reposts that I would do or stories that women would share with me, I think my mom started to realize, like, why did she have that stigma towards it? Why, where did that come from? And she's like, it's beautiful. Yes, exactly. Past generations, right? Right. Now she's totally on board and she loves it every time she's out and she's like i'm at like where she'll she'll be like chilies and she'll be like there's this mom over there that's breastfeeding with the cover and i just want to go tell her she can breastfeed if she wants that we don't mind <laughs> like, Aww, she's just so cute <laughs> i love that yeah oh my gosh that's amazing i think that it's so cool to see you as like a breaking that generational shame so to speak we're just like this is how yeah. we do things seeing that and then posting it 
Because there's moments where I still get a little nervous if I'm in a new environment to breastfeed yeah. Ocean, especially because she's so wiggly now. And I'm just like, <laughs> she's going to pop off and everybody's going to see yeah. my nipple. <laughs> but um, it's okay if you want to wear a cover, mm-hmm. if that's what you want. But why also, too, if you don't want to use it? Yes. Are you feeling? I think it's important. I always say you should feed however you feel most comfortable. If you're using a cover, I hope that you sit down and think to yourself, am I using a cover because this is what makes me feel most comfortable or am I using it because I feel like I need to? Because you have to. Yes. Or you should. Yes. Or- yeah. And so I hope that if you feel that you have to because of other people around you, I hope you find my page. <laughs> Yeah. So we can help with that. <laughs> Go follow the little milk bar. Yeah. <laughs> Underscore, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. On Instagram. Yes. And TikTok. and TikTok. Yes. And Facebook. Well, that journey is so cool. And it's so cool that it was birthed from your heart. Because I feel like when it comes to building community, that is such an important key. If you are like in a leadership role to be connected to that. And not just being like, oh, I'm making all the money, you yeah. know, like money is great. And also too, like people look up to you. Like I read the comments, I read the things like you have a tribe and you <laughs> built that through being vulnerable. We have an amazing community. I swear. I always say it. We have the best community on social media. There is like there's never any negativity. Wow. I think one time we've had and I get the question always too, like, how do you deal with negative comments? And it's like, honestly, oh, let TikTok is a completely different story weird people on tiktok <laughs> on instagram like sally we... Joe, one two three 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> but on instagram like our community is so tight-knit and like we just don't allow that kind of behavior there so it just doesn't we don't really ever get it wow it's awesome that's awesome yeah so much support from all the moms everybody parents. it's almost like your boldness and your brown like anyone that doesn't agree with it just is like yeah then not... just don't follow yeah Go away keep scrolling exactly <laughs> mm-hmm. i love that Um, Well, let's kind of shift perspectives a little bit and talk about you being a Latina owned businesswoman. What are some adversities? Has there been any, you know, of those types of adversities being a Latin owned business owner? Yeah. So there's so many, right? Like how this could be a long talk. (laughs) Yeah. Whatever you want to say. I mean, this is your stage. (laughs) It's it's a lot. I think a lot, especially in Utah, because there's not a ton of diversity here. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned growing up, too, is I grew up in Kearns, which is like the West Side. Like there is so much diversity there a lot. And so growing up in that environment, I felt like. There was tons of diversity. And then when I got older and then I got into the business world and I kind of like went to events outside of my little bubble in Kearns, I realized how much we lacked diversity in our state. And so it's like when I go to business events or influencer events or this or that, it's almost like... (laughs) There's just not enough diversity here. There's not a lot of people that look like me. One, for being a woman, right? And two, but also being Latina. So it's like I never had anyone to, like, look at in the state of Utah for specifically in Utah. Like, who looks like me? Who's a Latina business owner here that I can look up to? And there just wasn't very many. So it's really awesome to be able to be you know, one that does step out and go into the world, even when it's scary and you're the only, um, you know, woman of color in the room sometimes. Um, Do you have an example or is there like things or processes that you go through mentally to like encourage yourself to just keep going? I just feel like there's like, there's not like one specific answer, I guess. There's just like, it just, it is what it is. And like, if I can be that person for somebody else, you know, a younger Latina girl that lives wherever in Utah or wherever in the United States, if she can look up and be like, oh, look, she looks like me and she did it. And so it's like, my dad is the first one to actually grow roots in the United States. So it's like, we don't have... Like, I'm second generation U.S. citizen. And it's like, we don't have generational wealth. We don't have, like, generational, generational, like, connections. You know, like, we didn't have businesses for years and years in in the United States to build that down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like my, my dad was the first one to grow that. And him and I are building this together for our you know, you, for my kids and their kids. So their gra- or my grandkids, that's weird to think about. This is us starting now and we do it for generations to come behind us, right? My grandkids, that seems so weird. <laughs> I'm going to be grandma <laughs> I <one day. laughs> love that though. I love that. And, and it just shows to your commitment and your passion. There's so many, I feel like 
there's so many people that maybe had it easier than you that are white or any other, you know, ethnicity and they have so much in front of them and they don't realize that this opportunity, they could have been way ahead, right? There's something to be said that I've found also too. My husband is, he's a first generation immigrant. His parents came over from Argentina and just seeing the work ethic that comes and also all of the hard things that come with racism or being a person of color Mm -hmm. that you push through to get to that point. Yeah. I feel like from an outsider perspective, because I was, I wasn't as aware of this until I became in partnership with him because I was white and I was privileged. And I'll say that because there was a truth. Yeah. And I've learned so much and try to open my mind up to that. And um, he's always been like my generation, generational wealth, like passing it down (laughs) because it's such a big opportunity. Yeah. There's so many people that just want to stay in the victim mode. And it's like, mm -mm. yeah. And you're just like passing that. And like the hardest workers I swear, like my my abuelo, he had like three jobs. Like he would get up, go to work at this like still mill. I don't even remember. And then like he opened a barber shop and he'd work there until four or five and then he'd go do another like is I'm like when did you sleep (laughs) like how did you do that but he did that to provide he came to America to provide a better life for him and his family and obviously I mean my my dad opened his own store from the ground up he didn't have connections he didn't have money to do that we were really poor for a really long time it was really hard has it become a success yes because he's worked forever (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to yeah. build it but um it showed me that I can do that too you know it's almost mm-hmm. like we have nothing to lose kind of a mindset so it's like let's just work really hard see where this goes and let's let's start growing our roots in the United States and it's just been really cool to see my dad do that and then me do that and then let's see what my kids want to do I don't know yeah <laughs> you're showing them what's possible yeah. and that's so empowering i feel like as a mother because that's all that you want for your kids is yeah. to give them the best life mm-hmm. and to see you take that and run with it is so powerful i mean we'll see yeah. i'm like my kids maybe they want to be business owners maybe they don't whatever yeah. they want to do we'll be happy with but i'm glad that we're starting to give them a little bit of guidance here which is great i love that but back to your brand what do you say to the mothers who are like formula feeders Mm -hmm. that say you're shaming me by being an advocate for breastfeeding so i can again going back to my community i've never had that comment on any of our posts ever i have seen that on like other things i've seen people comment that or say that um but i think you should feed your baby however it works for you and your baby whether that's breastfeeding or formula feeding, only you know what's best for you and your baby. So Mm -hmm. I don't ever shame formula feeding moms, but we are just empowering the moms who are breastfeeding because it's so many obstacles to go through and it's a hard, lonely time. Does that mean that formula feeding moms don't have a hard, lonely time? No. I'm on my journey with breastfeeding. This is what this brand is about. So we're talking specifically about breastfeeding and those obstacles. So we're just empowering that even more. We don't ever shame formula feeding moms yeah. or parents, whatever. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I posted this after I had Ocean. I posted this video on Facebook um, and it could have been the platform I was using, but there were so many comments. It like went to like 150,000 views and oh all these comments. Um, Because I was sharing a statistic that I wasn't aware of before until I was told after six months to a year, your your milk loses nutrients. A nurse told me that. A nurse told you that? Told me that you you don't need to feed your baby after that. And so I was like, I realized that that's actually a lie. Like, why would my body (laughs) body continue to provide, right? Yeah. Um, And I think there's so much misinformation about breastfeeding out there and stuff. So I posted this video and these people were going off and mom's like, you shouldn't be formula shaming. Like a fed baby is a happy baby. So whatever. And I'm like, I never said anything. Yeah. So it's not formula shaming. You're just giving information, educating and talking about your own own experience. So never unless you're specifically saying something about formula, then OK. But other than that, it's never it, nobody's shaming anybody there. We're just talking about this specific subject. Right. It's like saying, OK, I'm going to open up an Instagram account about how much I love pink. Pink, pink, pink. I just love pink. Everything's going to be pink. But then someone comes on and says, well, blue is really cool, too. Well, sure, it is cool, but I'm a pink account, so we're going to talk all about pink. I didn't say I didn't like blue. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like kind of I love the that same. perspective. I guess it just brings things into, you know, full circle of 
of anything of difference, right? Because when you get on social media, there's always going to be a different opinion. Yeah. Something, <clears throat> mm-hmm. right? When you're going against the norm, dropping the cover can be scary if you've never mm-hmm. done it before and you're mm-hmm. a new mom or you're a mom that's breastfeeding and you've never dropped the cover. Yeah. How do you go about finding community? Obviously, your page. Yeah. Like, but if maybe in any form of going against cultural norms, yeah. how do you find community? Finding accounts like mine. Like, I mean, social media is so much a part of our lives, right? And like I said before, the more you see of something, the more normal it becomes. So social media was a big one for me. I mean, even when I was first uh, afraid to drop the cover, um, I remember seeing a few moms like bloggers or influencers, um, post a photo of them breastfeeding and it was like oh oh that's not like anything to be taboo about because like for so long we couldn't see it I mean Instagram and Facebook would just take it down I mean even when we started the little milk bar they kept taking down our posts so it's something we are continuously fighting but at the first you have that mindset of this is wrong I shouldn't be doing this um I don't see this anywhere because no one posts it but then when people start posting it and you see it you're like oh, wow, yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. Like, I can do this too. So following accounts, but also being a part of, like, local communities. Like, there's La Leche League and that you can join or talking to your friends about it, even talking to your spouse or partner about it. Um, I remember having conversations with my husband, Pete, and I'm like, hey, I'm kind of scared to breastfeed in public. And, like, sometimes your partners have no idea what you're going through. And I'm like, you know, we were at our friend's barbecue and I was breastfeeding and I was really nervous because I feel like people were looking at me. And he's like, that never even crossed my mind. I didn't even realize that you felt that way. So, like, having those conversations with people around you or your partner, most specifically your partner, and letting them know, hey, this makes me a little bit nervous and I'm a little bit scared. So, when I'm feeding in public, if you see me, can you please make your way to me and at least sit next to me or hold my hand or be next to me so I know that I have some support system with me? And to me, that was a big change for me. Once I had that conversation with Pete and he understood, even to this day, he knows I'm pretty fine with feeding in public. I don't get too nervous anymore, but he'll still make his way over to me if we're in a big crowded room and he sees me feeding because he just wants to be that support there and know that I'm not alone. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Well, it's so cool, too, to see that he supports you in that as well. Yeah. Oh, and I can't forget to say it's your legal right to breastfeed in public. So if you're nervous about that, know that I started to say this thing in my head that was no stranger's opinion matters over my baby's basic needs. So if your baby's sitting there crying and they're hungry, you're going to choose to not feed them in public because of what people might say around you. You're never going to see those people again. They don't matter. Right. Half the time, they don't even care. They won't even notice your feeding. Um, but there were times where I would hold off a feeding because I would just wait till we were leaving. And she's sitting at my port. Now that I think back about it, I am like, it makes me teary eyed because I mm-hmm. see my baby crying. And I'm like, oh, I'll just wait till we're leaving so I don't have to feed in public. And it's like, why would anybody else's opinion ever care over that? You know, and that was a big mindset that helped shift everything for me, too. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. I think it's mindset is so huge when you're Mm -hmm. trying anything new yeah and just like coaching yourself through it and Mm -hmm. then realizing it's actually not as scary (laughs) as you thought it was well half the time you think the whole room like in your mind everybody's staring at you and everybody's talking about you but really like you do it the first time you realize nobody actually really cares yeah half the time they don't say anything and they don't even know half the time they don't even notice yeah they don't even know that you're feeding they just think you're holding your baby that's so true how do you balance your like you have a lot of presence on social media you're very active on that you have this community you built it how do you navigate like this social media world as a mom and these other roles that you play as well so I think one I was kind of made for it like there's personalities out there that like just don't love social media or they don't like being in front of the camera and I always laugh with my mom because ever since I'm a kid if you look back at our old movies I, my mom will be videoing my sister and I'll jump in front of my sister and be like, did you get me? Hi, mom. Hey, look at me. <laughs> I, so I've never been afraid of the camera. And I liked since I was a kid being the center of attention. I, it's just kind of a funny joke in my family. But so it's never made me nervous or scared, but it is a lot. So it's like I don't get uncomfortable with it, but it is hard with the fact that there's so many different social media outlets. And like what if you follow a lot of TikTok accounts, they'll be like, you have to post 20 times a day to like grow. And it's like, who has time for that? Yeah. If you do great, <laughs> I don't. Um 
And then staying on track with all the trends. So for me, I just do whatever feels like I don't have a posting schedule. I don't like say I have to post this many times or I have to post in the morning. I just kind of do whatever feels right. And I think that's what made us feel or be so successful is because I post in the moment when things when I'm feeling certain things and that really connects with parents in general. So when they come across my post, they're like, oh, yeah, I felt like that before. Mm -hmm. And it's because I don't. I don't feel like I force it. I don't be like, oh, I have to post today, so I'm going to just post something random. Um, I mean, I, I'm not saying that doesn't always not work, but this is what works for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you're a so, mom, and I know there's a lot of moms out there that have yeah. businesses, and maybe it's not like geared around you know, yes. womanhood or breastfeeding right. or whatever, and they feel this pressure to always show up. And if you don't yeah. show up, and I know it's like a very masculine approach but I but I think it's important to also acknowledge that you can be successful and g dance to the beat of your own drum yeah well a lot of the times too like I there's this funny sound like on reels and tiktok right now that says everything is content everything is content yeah. um and it like I kind of laugh every time I hear it but it's so true because like you feel like you have to come up with this amazing content every day and you don't it's like you're having a hard day today. Um, if you're one that feels comfortable talking about it in front of people, then, you know, maybe talk about it on a video because it's going to help other people who are going through that currently or even in a week when they see it, um, they'll feel connected to it and be like, oh, my gosh, I've totally felt that way, too. Oh, my gosh, I love this, again. you know, because it's like something that really connects with people in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always like um, I had a really shitty night with the baby last night. She woke up like six times. I did not get any sleep. Oh. So it's like, you know what? Let's talk about that. Because a lot of the times we don't talk about that. She's almost a year old and everyone thinks, oh, she should be sleeping through the night right now. What's wrong? There's something <laughs> wrong. And are you feeding her to sleep? You're not supposed to feed her to sleep. And so like yesterday on my stories, I talked about that. Like, hey, she's almost one. And by the way, yes, I do feed her to sleep. I know you're not supposed, supposed to. Um I, a lot of people say that you're not supposed to do anything. You're making a bad to do. Yes, that's what they say. <laughs> or when they wake up, you shouldn't feed them and all these things. And it's like, you got to do whatever works for you. And so anytime things come up like that, I just talk about it and use it as content because it's stuff that needs to become normal anyways. But it's, it is hard sometimes. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. I started TikTok during um, in the thick of the pandemic. I remember my niece called me and she's in college in San Diego and she's like you gotta get on TikTok you gotta get on TikTok I'm like what I don't even know how to dance like what yeah. is this? and they're like doing yes. all this crazy shit and I'm like I know and so I'm like okay I'm just gonna try it and at the time there were no like business accounts there weren't like people that were like it was mostly dancing like teenagers. Yeah. So then I just started creating content around breastfeeding moms on, in, on TikTok, and we blew up pretty quickly, like way quicker than we ever grew up, grew on Instagram. And now our following on TikTok's bigger than Instagram. And it's because we were able to jump on it. I think before a lot, a lot of the businesses jumped on, but it's like, it has that magic, that platform. Yeah. yeah. It seems like it because it's like, so novel like you never know what's going to be right next. yeah you're like what is in my feed today and then you like my for you because page. you look and stay then another one comes yeah. on it's crazy well and i love it though because tiktok is like mm -hmm. don't get me wrong parents and like people our age are on it now but like yeah. a lot of it is geared towards the younger generation so it's like okay i may get hateful comments and may have like teenagers be like why is this on my for you page like i get that a lot but i'm like i freaking love it because it's like we're reaching like a younger demographic and even if they don't agree with it right now like they've seen a, a mom breastfeed on their tiktok page like i don't know if i can remember as a teenager ever seeing anyone breastfeed in front of me like when I think about it, I can't think about it at right. all. So right. it's like these these uh, younger kids, younger generation is seeing it, even if it's just me and they don't know me. It's like, oh, no, they've seen someone feed in public and hopefully they don't think it's weird anymore. You it's know, it's so powerful, <clears throat> like what you just said, because um, you think about how our generation was raised on like the media of like the fear around giving birth or like yeah. the, like <sighs> you never even would see anybody breastfeed right. because they'd be hiding in the bathroom. Yeah. Like I, when you talk about birth, I think too, I get so mad because I've never watched a movie or a TV show that ever shows birth that isn't so terrifying, right? Every single thing we watch, they're like screaming and like they're gonna die and they're cussing at their partner and it's awful. And it's like birth can doesn't always have to be that way. And it's not always that way. And 
I had the most amazing birth with Coda. And so um, when we did our home birth, um, we did a whole birth video. And my brother and niece actually did the song too. They did Sweet Child of Mine, like acoustic version. It was so beautiful. And um, I uploaded my video. And at first I'm like, should I put this in TikTok? Like for sure Instagram. But I'm like, TikTok is like kind of younger generation people are kind of weird on there like that's not that kind of content I'm like no the world should see that like birth doesn't always have to be scary too and even if these younger kids see it like hopefully this will trigger them like oh wow like birth can look like that Uh, yes we can like totally change the younger generation (laughs) with tiktok i'm like on a mission (laughs) exactly exactly normalizing what's normal and also empowering them to see things in a different way because Mm -hmm. that's how you actually break the generational you know, curses, the generational yes. trauma or patterns or like shift culture. Mm-hmm. Because I think that's what you're doing with Drop the Cover is just acknowledging with a bold in a bold way that this isn't how it has to be. Yeah. What would your advice advice be to moms that want to continue breastfeeding but are struggling? Reach out to a lactation consultant. I think so many people, a lot of people don't even know that they exist. Um, and a lot of people don't know that your insurance will like mostly cover it. I think most insurances will cover lactation consultant visits now. So one, reach out to lactation consultant. So many people reach out to me and ask me questions. And it is so hard to work with somebody over the internet. Like you really need to sit down with somebody one-on-one in person and have them see how your baby is latching and help show you how to get that proper latch. You can't do that over the internet. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling, um, find pages like mine. I'm not the only one. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know that there's others. So um, not just trying to toot my own horn, but just find pages that are about breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, talk to moms that are currently breastfeeding. But the biggest thing is remember that like if you talk to your pediatrician, pediatricians are not educated in lactation. I think that like throughout their entire Uh, schooling. I think they have like one class on lactation. It's like a really short class too. And so they don't know very much about it, honestly, or breast milk in general. So it's like reach out to someone who specifically went to school or has taken a course to learn about this. And lactation consultants are your best friends. You can find one on um, Google, like Google some in your area, but also look for reviews because not all lactation consultants are amazing. So as long as you have some good reviews, if you reach out to a friend, hey, have you reached out to a lactation consultant? Were they helpful? Did you like them? Um, But they're going to be your first stop because they're going to help you power through whatever it is that you're dealing with right now, whether that's mental or physical. Uh, I think that that's so important to feel supported in that and also like your husband can only support you so much <laughs> right. or maybe like maybe the people around you didn't breastfeed and you you need help. Yeah. Um, Cause I know there were multiple um, times where I was getting into my journey and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is so hard. I don't yeah. know if I can go another day. I like luckily have, you know, community and sisters. And this is actually before I found your page, um, which I'm so happy for now because I'm going to be referring it to everybody. But to feel supported in that and then to actually have my sister come over and Mm -hmm. help me she sat down with me because she had paid a lactation consultant so she had all these tips and stuff that she didn't know so it was from that so that's great well and it's important to know every baby is different too i'm on my third kid and i'm like oh i already did it once so when i had code i'm like this is gonna be cake because i had a lactation consultant show me and because i struggled with ellie and then like oh i'm gonna have coda and i know exactly what i'm doing it's gonna be beautiful No, it was not. My nipples were so sore. I had to get a prescription. Like all of these things, I needed to relearn how to latch him. And then on my third, I'm like, oh, yeah, I totally got this. No, I've been through two. I know what I'm doing. (laughs) No, I totally struggled again. (laughs) Every baby is different and you have different struggles with each one. So don't just assume because you've done it before that it's going to be easy the second time. Side note, with mom brain, I actually saw or I read the the best description that I've heard yet about mom brain. Okay. And it's in the book called Orgasmic Birth. And she says as a midwife that she believes that mother's brains change like when we become pregnant and the mom brain comes on and stays is because our minds are changing from like a logical linear way of thinking to an intuitive way Oh my gosh. because you have to simultaneously do so many different things, prioritize like the way that you care for your baby, like and everything. And I was like, that is That's the first crazy. time I've heard it in a positive. Yeah, I've like, never heard that before. That's pretty like, cool. I'm going to take that on yeah. and put it in my pocket. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So being a mom, mm-hmm. being a business owner, 
how do you structure your day or what are some things that you do to make your, cause obviously I know your kids are a priority and I know that there's a lot of working moms that struggle with mom guilt or struggle yeah. with like balancing or even like don't feel like they can have a successful business because yeah. of yeah. being a mom. What do you like? How do you balance that? So there's no balance. I learned that from my friend Susan, um, who uh, is the owner of Freshly Picked, but she told me from the beginning that there's no such thing as real balance. And it's like a total myth. And I think once I heard that, I'm like, then you're not like striving and feeling guilty all the time. I mean, I still feel guilty, but there's no perfect balance between work and motherhood at all. Um, But it was a it's a struggle. Like it is hard, especially like with a baby and I'm breastfeeding. Pete can't just breastfeed her. So I'll say Pete quit his job in October or not October. It was April of last year. So 2021. Um, he was working a lot and the business was growing and I sat him down and I'm like, hey, if you quit your job and just give me one year, I promise like I could blow the little milk bar out of the water. <laughs> I'm like, just give me one year to help me grow it because if I've grown it this much with having to stay home with all the kids I can't imagine how much it, I could grow it if you were home watching the kids for me and he's like okay let's do it so he quit his job the business grew like crazy but it's still hard because I could not figure out how to schedule my days right so it's like you're a mother you're at home especially now that I have the baby she's still breastfeeding and not taking a bottle very well so like right now my schedule is I go to work in my office I try to go around nine and then I try to be home by one or two because that's when she needs to eat it. I'll feed her, top her off right before I leave. And then I'm always constantly checking in with Pete. Is she okay? How's the kids? Do you, how are you doing? And, and I always try to be home at one or two. So I never get like the actual full day at the office. But what I will say is I'll come home, feed her. Um, we'll be up a little bit. And then when she goes down for bedtime, I'm working or when she takes a nap, I'm working throughout the day. So it's still chaotic. (laughs) I don't have any set schedule. It's always just when the kids can go to bed or when I'm out at in my office, those few hours in the morning, that's when I try to get the most work done. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I have help, right? So like my husband's at home being a stay-at-home dad, taking care of the kids, and not everybody has that. So I'm so incredibly thankful for that. But those first three years where I didn't, it was um, constant. You cannot juggle all the balls. One of them's going to fall. If my house is a disaster, then my inbox is clean. But if our house is clean and I did the dishes that night, then I have a thousand emails. It's just one or the other. And it's constant. Just the other day, I had to miss my daughter's first softball game. And she's like, mom, you know, I try to code all their stuff. I go to code a soccer game, baseball game, Allie's. But there was this one thing I could not reschedule. And I'm like, I had to sit her down like, Allie, I'm so sorry. I'm not able to. To come to your game, but I, I do have something that's important for work. Please know that you're important. I'll come to like all of your, most of your other games, but there's just once in a while where I'm not going to be able to come. And she's like, it's okay, mom. Um, I think it's just important to change that narrative because how many games did my husband miss because he had work, right? So it's like, there's just so much more pressure on the mom to be that default parent where you're constantly the only one there and you're the one sending them off to school and making their lunches and taking them to their games. But why isn't that narrative also for the dads, you know? So it's important for me to have the conversation with my kids. Like, this is what mom does for work. This is how we keep our house. This is how we have money to go on vacation. This is how we have money to play softball. So occasionally I'm going to have to go do those things. And in our house, the kids just get it. Like they're, they're fine with it. We make it work. What a great partnership that you have in, in order for you guys to kind of prioritize the little milk bar right now and prioritize that and then be able to have those conversations like communication is key, right? Oh, communication is key. Yes. So then like, do you have burnout? How do you deal with that? All the time. (laughs) Every day. (laughs) Are you just soaking in your boob bath bombs? Yes. I do use those quite a bit. And it's hard on my husband too, right? Because he'll be like, are you ever going to take time off? Like you said, you're just this week I was supposed to take, or was it last week? Gosh, my, my weeks are rumbling into one. I was supposed to take Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off because I had worked nonstop and all weekend for like two weeks in a row. We had like a collaboration. We brought an influencer in. We did a photo shoot. And then like 
Like I just had, didn't have a day off. And so when I don't have a day off, that means he's with the kids 24 seven and he also needs a day off. And so I'm like, Hey, I'm going to take Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off. And then these meetings got pushed and I could not move them. Like I just couldn't do it. And I ended up having to work Wednesday anyways. And so we had to switch my days around. Okay. I'm going to work Wednesday, but I'm going to take Friday off. And he's like, Oh, like, how do I schedule my stuff if you change your stuff so often? And it's like, I know I'm tired too. <laughs> yeah, everybody's but, tired up in here. <laughs> yeah, so it's important to me to take that time off. And um, other than that one weekend, that was a crazy week where I did have to move my days off. I do try to stick to my days. Saturday, Sundays, I try to take as much time as I can. Every once in a while, I do have a photo shoot I have to do. But for the most part, I try to schedule everything throughout the week so I can at least have two solid days where we're focusing on the kids. We wake up, we walk, we go on a walk to the park or we do their softball stuff or baseball or soccer. And I really do focus on the kids. So that weekend feels like it's family time 100% of the time. And then Monday through Friday, they're at school and I'm at work kind of a thing. Um, So do I get burned out? Yes. Because even when I say I'm going to be home at five, I end up working when the kids go to bed because I didn't get all my emails done or whatever. So I'm still figuring it out. There's no answer. (laughs) I don't know. Tell me if you figure it out. (laughs) Yeah, that's why I'm asking. I know there's a lot. So you got to figure out what works for you and also have grace for yourself that you're not going to be perfect. I like to do like I will try to do at least two vacations a year where I'll like force myself. And I'll, so we just booked a trip to Hawaii and I'm like, Hey, we're taking four days or five days. We're going to Hawaii. And like, I, I'm not going to work there. I, I swear. <laughs> but then my friend Jenny, who just moved to Hawaii, I'm like, but maybe we'll go see her. And she's like one that we did a collaboration with. So I don't know. It's just funny. And You're like, I will not get my computer. Out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. Because we come friend, like yeah. you become friends, you know, and like when Jenny came to visit, she brought her husband and my husband and her husband got along really well, too. So it's kind of fun sometimes fun and not fun. But in our world with social media and like influencers and businesses that are growing on social media, like your life kind of intertwines with work a lot, you Mm -hmm. know, like, yes, we met on social media. Yes, we work a lot together, but we're also friends. So when we see each other, it's not always work. It's just fun. (laughs) I love that. That's awesome. Because you guys have grown so organically with your following and with your, your platforms and everything that you post. I know that there's a lot of people out there looking to have a solid following, not like you know, just random strangers, but people that advocate for them, people that that want to create that community like feel. Mm -hmm. What are some tips to doing that? So you have to know what your purpose is. So like my purpose is obviously very clear and it's about breastfeeding moms. And when I first started, I'm like, should I target all moms and talk about breastfeeding moms? And should I also make like formula, like t-shirts or whatever? And it's like, I just got, you got to stick to what your niche is. What are you passionate about? And you can't please everybody. Don't try to appeal to everybody. So like once I decided to stick to just like breast feeding and empowering those women, then I was like, okay, I know exactly who I'm talking to. So every single time I create a post, instead of trying to say the right words or trying to appeal to everybody, I picture the exact person that needs to, I I guess you could say the five-year-old old Lindsay, the one who needs to hear my words. I picture that person and talk to them specifically. Mm -hmm. And the people who need to find you will hear that, see that, read that, and just come to you like a moth to a flame. Because then they're going to tag their friend and be like, oh my gosh, I read this post and it was just what we were talking about at the park yesterday. And so then they're tagging their friends. And um, so, so talking to one direct person all the time and not trying to please everybody, but also showing that you're human when you do drop the balls. Like when you ask me, do I get burnout? Yeah, I do get burnout. And for like um, a week at a time, I might just be missing from my Instagram stories and people are like, are you okay? (laughs) Is everything all right? And then I'll come back and be like, look, to be honest, I was having a really shitty week. (laughs) It was hard. The kids were all sick and, you know, I worked too hard the week before and I just needed a full on break. And people understand that, you know, Mm -hmm. they're like, oh my gosh, I felt like that too. I just overworked myself the other day too or whatever so being real and not ever forgetting to give back to your community like from the beginning it's always been and you know we can't give something to every single person that follows us but I always try to do you know coffees on me you know if you were up with a baby all night I'll like post a gift card for Starbucks and I'll let everybody know when it reaches zero but go get a coffee on me or um, how many of you are struggling maybe financially right now or maybe you uh, are working mom and 
working dad and you're trying to juggle groceries and manage the house and get home and then you still have to cook and you're so burned out. So let me buy you dinner and we'll like pick 10 people and send them a DoorDash gift card. And it's like those things are important. What are You're asking a lot of your community to follow you, like you, share your content. But what are you also giving back to them in return? And I think that not enough accounts, people in general, businesses, brands think enough about that, Mm -hmm. that that's what it's all about, right? Kindness and humanity and giving back to everybody not everybody, as many people as you can. Right. And at the beginning, that was maybe one DoorDash gift card a week that I could do. And now since the business has grown, I can do more at a time. But just do what you can with what you have. I love that. Why do you think that people forget to do that? Um, Because they're selfishly thinking about themselves and not on purpose. Like, I don't think people's like, oh, I'm going to selfishly do everything for me. But I think, especially as an entrepreneur or a business owner or a brand, if you're trying to grow a social media um, following, you're thinking, how can I get more followers? And it's constantly about you. How can I create more content? How can I do this? And it's like, we just forget like how much opening a door for somebody is, how much um, paying for their coffee when they're struggling to count their change at the counter. And it's like, I just, I don't know. I hope that I always say again, the more you see of something more normal it becomes. So like I do it. And then now I'm like seeing other accounts do it, which is really awesome. And people will reach out and be like, did you see so-and-so did a Starbucks gift card too? And I'm like, yeah, that not that amazing? Like how cool? Like I, it doesn't bother me. Do it. I hope all the accounts do it. You yeah. know, <laughs> you're like, just like everybody dropping the cover. I yes. hope everybody <laughs> drops the cover. Right. We're walking out, free the nipple, get yes. the milk fed. <laughs> I mean, get the babies fed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, I like that perspective because I think it is so easy to see like people that have a large following let it get to their head. Yeah. They think that they're God's gift. And yeah. and that's the thing with social media. Number one, you never actually know what's going on outside of right. like what you see on there. But keeping it real and bringing the human aspect of you and your imperfections, not that you're always talking about that, right? Yeah. But like showing that helps people know that you're real. Yeah, I think that that's something that we need more of. I remember my dad used to always tell me, do you, there's two types of people in this world. There's givers and there's takers. Which one do you want to be? And like, I remember him telling me that when I was like 10 years old. And I just remember thinking like, I don't ever want to be a taker. I mean, obviously you can take things from people and ask for help when you need it, but it's like, I want to be the one that is giving if I can, even if it doesn't mean monetary all the time, it means like opening the door or helping a woman uh, who's struggling with her groceries or whatever that is. So it's always just been important to me in my business that I wanted to be able to give as much as I can. And are we like a nonprofit organization? No, by no means are we that. Yeah. yeah. But like, I want to continue to do things like this. I don't care how big the brand gets, like we'll always give back to people in any way that we can. And and to it, it almost makes it more fun. You it's know? so much fun. It's my favorite part. I love doing it. I love doing You're it. You're like, what am I going to give yes. this money to today? Let's yeah. go. <laughs> it's just so much fun, you know. Oh. You never know who needs it. Like you said, you never know what somebody's struggling with behind doors. Even someone who's very public and a big influencer with a huge following, they could be, I mean, for instance, just a few weeks ago, and I haven't even talked about this on Little Milk Bar at all, but a few weeks ago, we had a scary incident with our baby where we had to call 911, and we thought that we had lost her it was one of the most terrifying things but like I mean we just don't talk about everything on social media you know so you just never know what somebody is dealing with and like there was someone that I followed on social media on the little milk bar and she happened to be one of the recipients of our DoorDash gift card and like on her page she always just looks so happy and like her like everything looks great you know and then like she reached out privately and she was like thank you so much for this you have no idea like my husband had just lost his job Um, My son got really sick and we had huge medical bills and looking at her page, you would like never think any of these things. So it's just you never know what someone's going through and to be able to help someone even when you don't know what you're giving. Like, I mean, it just goes a long way. 100 percent. And people feel people feel that, too, like if it's real or not. Right. And that's another thing, too, that I think is important, like you were saying about building community as being authentic and being vulnerable. Yeah. Do you ever get 
burnt out from being vulnerable or do you ever feel yeah. like nervous to post before you share your vulnerability? Yeah, there's a lot of things I've been nervous to post about. And sometimes I have to check myself like, is this going to help somebody? I mean, we can't always help somebody right with our own stories. There's got to be some sort of limitation there. I can't share everything about my life. Some things need to be private. Some things I need to go through with me and my own family without talking about everything publicly. But then there are some times where I have to think about like, is this something that's important enough that would really impact somebody else's life and I'm okay sharing it. And so it's hard. (laughs) You have to think sometimes, is this worth it to share or is it not? There was a part where when she was freshly born, I want to say like maybe a few months old where I started talking about her sleep and how she was still waking up like six times a night. And we weren't like, I was a walking zombie for probably the first like seven, eight months of her life. I was not getting sleep. Which is crazy because I've had three. This is my third kid now. And my first kid was sleeping through the night at five weeks. So it's like yeah. when I say every baby, every baby is different. It's so true. And you think you got to handle, you know how to get them to sleep. No, it doesn't work for all the kids. Let me just say that. Um, <laughs> But I did share a little bit about that. And I was like, you know what? I did this and it helped. And I got so much like so many people reaching out be like, how could you do that? Or why would you do that? I can't believe that. And then other people are like, oh, my gosh, I needed to hear this. Like, this is everything I needed to hear to help me. And guess what? My baby um, finally got me. Let me have four hours of sleep in one night. And I haven't had that in eight months. And it's like no matter what you do, sometimes you'll get, you know, people that don't agree with it. But. I mean, and then I'm like, gosh, do I ever want to share that again? Do I ever want to talk about yeah, your sleep? You're putting yourself out on the right. line, man. <laughs> I know. It's like scary. It, definitely never show my kids in the car seat. It's like you can't. That's like the well-known like in the influencer <laughs> world too, like or bloggers. They're like, don't ever show your kid in the car seat because someone's going to say something like her shop isn't high enough or I can't believe you put her in that kind of car seat or whatever. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. that is great. And and I think, you know, it, what you said is important to acknowledge that that you do keep some stuff private because I know on my own journey of building businesses and being vulnerable and sharing my truth and stories online, there's this expectation at one point that I felt that I wasn't being authentic because I wasn't sharing every little detail of every little thing. And I think that, like you said, that you have to put limits mm-hmm. on that. And so how do you discern again between what you share and you not share? I don't know. <laughs> it's always a learning process. So in I'll, that moment, it feels right. <laughs> yeah. So like, I'll try to think, is this something one I'm worth sharing with the world? And two, will, can this help a lot of other moms? And like, I don't know, those questions can go in so many different directions. So because there's so much about my life that people don't know that I've never shared on the little milk bar. And um, I probably never will. But I try to stay on track with what's important with our brand. What is our following following us for? What is our niche? And when it comes to those things, I'm usually a little bit more willing to share anything outside of that is kind of outside of my boundaries. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Boundaries are so important. Yeah. It also brings clarity too. I'm sure helps with like how you're sharing content. Wow. Well, do you have like a message that you want to share with our listeners before we wrap it up here we've said it several times already use your voice even if it shakes we have your back but I it's not just for breastfeeding it's for everything like if you're the only female in the room and you're a business owner or you're working in corporate and you're the only female in the room and you're afraid to speak up like I just hope that goes through your mind and you think use your voice even if it shakes even if it's scary if it's important you need to speak up wow that's amazing and the more you do it yeah, I feel like the, the less better. your voice shakes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. But you just got to keep practicing that. Mm-hmm. Wow, Lindsay, thank you so much for your time and you're just showing up and sharing everything that you did. I know that our listeners are going to love this episode. Where can our listeners find you? So at the little milk bar underscore on Instagram and then TikTok, Facebook, it's just at the little milk bar. Can you spell that? Uh, the little milk bar. T H E L I T. T L E M I L K. I'm like B A R, but B A R. Yes. See, okay. I can't even finish it. Just for the people that it's aren't so watching long. the video, that maybe are like listening and they're like, "Wait, how do yes. I type that in?" Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Yes. You're amazing. Thank you. <laughs>